so I'm John Landman. I'm the acting director of the Institute of Cognition and Culture at Queen's University Belfast. I try to combine social anthropology and cognitive anthropology together to answer questions about religion, atheism, morality, intergroup relations. And there's sort of two core questions that I ask in my research, which started with ethnographic field work with atheists, moving into survey and now some experimental research. First question is, why do some people become theists and others become non-theist? What are the key predicting factors to who ends up a theist and who ends up a non-theist? Uh, the account that I developed uh, utilizing a theory from Joe Henrik on credibility enhancing displays, and then also my field research with atheists in Scandinavia, in the US, and the UK, uh, is that exposure to actions and not just words that testify to religious belief is a key predicting factor in who ends up becoming a theist and who ends up becoming a non-theist, more so than socialization, more so than a variety of other uh, uh, factors. And in particular, I'm interested in hypocrisy, perceived hypocrisy, or what, what I might call CRUDs, credibility undermining displays. So an example would be, let's say, uh, I tell you that blue mushrooms are toxic. And now we're traveling, we're both very hungry, we come across the field of blue mushrooms, there doesn't seem to be other food around, do I avoid that food? You know, if I actually was lying to you and I didn't think they were toxic, I'd be all over the blue mushrooms. Uh, but by me not eating the blue mushrooms, it's an action uh, that is supporting the verbal statement that I gave to you previously. So in relation to religion, what we'd say is someone might offer you verbal testimony, God is watching you, God punishes, God punishes all of us, beware. Then are they actually fasting? Are they obeying rules? Are they doing all the things that you would expect them to do if they took the ideas seriously. Uh, that's this idea that the embodiment of religion, and so all of those actions that embody those beliefs are creds. And if there's an, if there's an action that would directly contradict the stated belief, uh, let's say uh, you say that there's an all-powerful God that punishes sin, and then you abuse little children. Uh, this would be a credibility undermining display, and the prediction from, from our, our point of view would be that you would see people not just think of those individuals as bad people, but they would actually lower their level of credence in the ideology that these folks are offering. That's the, that's the basic idea. So, I mean, not to oversimplify, but is it a matter, is it a matter of observing people walking the, walking the walk, exactly. so to speak, versus exactly. not walking the walk and just talking the walk? Yes, in a nutshell. It's about walking the walk and not just talking the talk that seems to be a prime predictor. And this can connect up with larger theories of secularization of, say, why the United States has remained so religious well. Uh, say, Northern Europe has become quite irreligious, where a variety of factors that reduced feelings of threat in those environments. It turns out one of the effects of threat is it makes you embody your commitments. You're sort of signaling to other people that you're a good cooperator, and you st those in-group norms sort of become more at play in your behavior. So when you start taking threat away, people may believe, but they're not acting it out as much. They don't feel that sort of conviction. And then their children grow up in an environment where those ideas might be around, but they're not embodied, and I think kids grow up skeptical. So you see in Scandinavia in the second half of the 20th century, it's not an immediate change in levels of belief after the welfare states all you know, really come into force. It's a generational shift. It's about the next 25 years or so you really see it drop. So I think it's a transmission thing huh. for the most part. So the, the threat reduction, right? So are you saying in the states that there's actually, there's been historically less threat reduction than in Northern Europe, let's say? Is that the, the dichotomy? And if so, how does how's that played out? Yes, you know, I, th I think that's right. It's the idea that some nations through ethnic homogeneity, through strong social welfare states, produce populations where people are pretty secure in the sense of themselves and their future prospects, their children's future prospects. And there aren't all of these threats that we have evidence uh, that they would cause the embodiment of group commitments. So if you, uh, a lot of research from terror management theory, coalitionary psychology, a lot of th things. So if you threaten people, they become more committed to in-group ideologies or you know, if maybe an in-group ideology is a religion, then you're gonna have more embodiment of religious practice. You can also have extrinsic religious participation in the face of threat. So people that see that religious groups are really the only game in town for social insurance. So they'll go and hang out at the mosque and that's where how they can overcome uh, famines or you know difficult times with uh, uh, finances. Um, and then the third one would be what we casually call superstition. So in the face of threat, you'll see a lot of people doing you know, certain types of prayers or superstitious actions. And all of those again are actions and not just words 
that testify to those religious beliefs. So it's really, we think that part of the reason why religion has kept going for as long as it has, at these levels of threat, keeping the, the impetus for creds going, and in some environments where you really lower threats, all of those things that keep pumping up the performance of the tradition are lowered, and then you start to see the beliefs fall off as a consequence. Right, so, and then specifically with regard to the states, I mean, some people would say, well, the United States is, you know, arguably the most developed country in the world. You know, how would one explain the pretty extensive persistence and even growth of religion in large yes. segments of American society versus, let's say, Europe, which is, you know, relatively comparable on a socioeconomic yeah. level? I mean, it's finally starting to drop in the U.S. in the last 15 years or so. You're starting to see that in surveys, but it's a good, I mean, it's a massive outlier in terms of the, the rest of the Western world. And I'd say it's a combination of a lack of a strong social welfare state, and so high levels of economic inequality and a sort of you're-on-your-own mentality, plus, and I think this is a big one, high levels of ethnic heterogeneity and this idea of different waves of immigrants coming in that were viewed by people as threats and would, would make each group sort of, you know, uh, hold a little bit closer to their own and their own traditions and perform those traditions as displays of commitment to show themselves as good cooperators. Uh, so I think it's between the constant feeling of dis-ease that is present in the United States and has been for a long time where people very rarely feel that all is fine with the world and nothing bad could happen. What happens if I lose my job? There's no safety net. What happens if I get sick? Uh, that these are very real concerns. Um, and that, and then, oh my gosh, there is an ethnically defined underclass, and whichever side of that divide you're on, uh, you have a, an other that is always sort of in mind as, as potentially a threat for your vision of society and how it's supposed to be. Hmm. So would that, would that explain why even in places with relatively similar immigration patterns, uh, historically like Australia or Canada, you, st you don't see that same degree of religiosity because there was never that, um, that existential threat, like you said, regardless of, of which side of that divide you fell on, but there was this underclass that was brought over as slaves and then this ruling class that was probably also fearful of the repercussions of ins having enslaved people for so long. Do you think that that specific dynamic, that, that slavery dynamic and, and what's perpetuated since? I think that makes a lot of sense because I've always struggled with Canada and Australia where I said, well, you know, some of the factors that I'm talking about in the U.S. were also present in some of these other places, so why, why would it be there? And so, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the big ones for me is that, uh, that it is this idea that the diverse groups are not just, yeah, we're all kind of in our, our areas. It's this idea that one group has control and the other group is a potential threat to that sense of control. I think the creds creds story is a better link between those sociological measures and belief than the sort of comfort hypothesis of religion, that religion comes because the world is bad and we're all gonna die and we're all, we all need comfort in the face of that. So many religious traditions, especially older and indigenous traditions, have a lot of malevolent spirits. Uh, spirits that you have to always sort of fend off and that are not, they're not there for your comfort. So I don't, I don't know if I'd want to say that all supernatural agent belief is rooted in a, a need for comfort. I don't see that. Uh, plus, you find the most comforting religious ideas in the modern affluent West. You know, uh, New Age beliefs, uh, Christianity where God is your buddy and will do everything for you and loves you eternally rather than sort of an older vision of, of Christianity where uh, you know, there's hellfire and brimstone. Uh, so I, I don't buy the comfort idea uh, that, that some sociologists do, and so I think the, the threat psychology and then creds dynamic is a more psychologically realistic way to connect the dots on that. That's really cool, yeah, it, I mean, it's just, it feels pretty satisfying. It just sits pretty well with what we observe in day-to-day -day life, so. So I need to, you know, there's more work to be done to try to substantiate it, but that's how I'm trying to connect the dots, and I certainly don't want to say that creds creds is the only factor that determines who ends up a theist and who ends up a non-theist. I'm very interested in moral outrage of, of atheists that see, uh, or you know, they, maybe they were theists, but view religious morality as harmful, actually immoral, the idea that it's oppressive or divisive, and this can alienate them, not just from religious traditions, but this idea of religion in general. Uh, I think that's also an important component, though I don't think it's as important or strong as creds creds. So that's one main question that I, that I work on. Uh, the other one uh, that I've gotten into more recently is why individuals become willing to die for a religious identity. So looking at martyrdom, so collaborating with Harvey Whitehouse, Scott Atron, 
uh, Angel Gomez, Michael Burmester, a variety of other folks, uh, on an account that goes against a lot of the sort of public debate about this, which says certain religions will you know, promote more violence, or it's about the belief content is the real thing, or it's how committed you are, or how um, uh, levels of fundamentalism, or this kind of thing. So the data we have now is suggesting that that's not so much the case, and that one of the most important variables that would determine how a religion might cause somebody to be willing to sacrifice their life is a sense of fusion with a religious identity to where the religious identity is not just one identity among many that you have, but it's an essential component of your personal autobiographical self-concept, this idea that I would no longer be me if I didn't have this religious identity. I could change my hair, I could change my clothes, uh, may, you know, and depending on how attached you are to your family, you could say, uh, if my family went away, I would still be me, or no, I'm fused with my family. If you take my family away, I feel like a different person. I have to remake my whole image of who I am. That that's sort of how we think about fusion. And so rather than it being the content of a religious identity, what we're finding is that regardless of the content, even if it's super peaceful content, if you fuse with that identity and then see it under threat, people can become willing to sacrifice their lives. So we've got data now with American Christians uh, that regardless of where they fall on the liberal conservative Christian spectrum, uh, if they're fused with Christianity, that's what best predicts them willing, that they become willing to sacrifice their life to, um, to help other Christians. They will go to prison to allow other Christians out of prison. Uh, they will die if it brings Christianity to large numbers of people, uh, if that religion is under threat. So they, 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 they do that, and it didn't matter. There was no interaction with levels of conservatism, liberalism, or the content of whether they saw Christianity as universal or parochial or whatever. Um, and then uh, Scott Atron has some, some recent research in Morocco uh, with some communities uh, there where uh, fusion with a local group of buddies has an interaction with levels of sacred values that people had, the extent to which they saw values as sacred. That predict, those two things work together to predict who was willing to sacrifice for Sharia law uh, in Morocco. So we're, we're looking to put in some grants now and to, to do some research on, on taking this across a wide range of religious traditions and different methodologies to look at uh, how people become fused to a religious uh, tradition or anything for that matter. We think dysphoric experience has a big part of it. So rites of terror, ritual initiations can do it. Uh, or continued harassment and persecution of you and your group. This idea that you're not just under some kind of threat, but an existential threat and your fate is tied to the fate of this group. The world doesn't let you forget that you're a Muslim. The world doesn't let you forget that you're black in the US. Uh, and so we would then make predictions that people of more oppressed minority groups are gonna be more fused to their, their, those particular identity groups. Uh, and so we're looking to uh, test those ideas in a variety of places. We've got data now from uh, Libyan revolutionaries that were, were collected during the uprising against Gaddafi. There's uh, Scott Atron's work uh, in, uh, in Morocco. And he, he just uh, has been gathering data in Syria and Iraq recently, working with Kurdish fighters and actually administering measures to them uh, on the field of battle uh, between uh, gunfire exchanges. Uh, so we're, we're trying to, to do lab experiments and online surveys, but then also getting out to places of where people actually are putting their lives on the line for uh, national identities, religious identities, and looking at fusion dynamics with that. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, implications for all this work for, uh, for creds creds, I think it's looking at a, a combination of psychological processes like a creds creds bias, interacting with the environment to help explain the variation that we see. Uh, so it can, can maybe help bridge some of these divides between more ecological approaches and historical approaches and then more uh, psychological approaches. And then on, on fusion, the implications I think are, are, are really important that uh, understanding how it is that people can become willing to fight and die for wider identities is rapidly becoming, I think, one of the more pressing questions uh, in, in our time. And so we're looking at trying to use evolutionary modeling, field research, uh, historical research, uh, any kind of research we can do basically in a large team uh, to better address that question. If what you're saying is true, and it's much more the fusion that's the, that's the driving factor as opposed to the actual content, 
I mean, that seems like a, it seems both deeply counterintuitive to, to you from a naive perspective, and but also hugely important in terms of policy repercussions, right? So maybe you can just speak to that a little bit about that difference between it's just the content of the religion, because this is what people generally think, you know, a religion says bad stuff, people do bad stuff. Sure. So a lot of folks do have this idea that religious texts program people, right? If you want to know why people of a particular faith tradition do as they do, read the text that that tradition is founded on and that gives you your answers. Uh, religious studies scholars, anthropologists for some time have, have really problematized that where say you go to a Buddhist country, now you read all these Buddhist texts, does that tell you anything at all about what people believe on the ground and their practices? Not, not very much. So the idea that you know uh, Buddha isn't a supernatural agent, really? I mean, when you, when you go on the ground and talk to folks, certainly certainly seems that way. Um, so this idea that people are programmed by text doesn't seem to match up the ethnographic reality very well. And then secondly, we have a lot of research in cognitive psychology that though you can hold beliefs at an explicit level and think that they're true, it's an open question as to how much they're influencing the rest of your underlying implicit cognition. Um, so this idea that it's just basic and people are programmed by the text and that explains all their behavior has both psychological problems and ethnographic problems. Uh, so in trying to connect up religions to behavior, certainly don't want to say that content never matters or it's worthless or you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't want to say anything, but I think it's nowhere near the main player. Uh, and it may be counterintuitive, at least to our sort of Western notion of people who belong to a faith group that is attached to a book and this says something about them, but that's a very small sliver of human history to where that's how religion has, has worked. Um, and looking at how people become willing to fight and die for a tradition and why it would be one individual rather than another when they all might believe very similar things, uh, that these identity issues, I think, come to the fore in terms of their explanatory power. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it is going to come down to the case of looking at histories of harassment, uh, uh, dysphoric experiences that those folks went with that made them feel a sense of shared fate with other people of their group, uh, and then the threatening of that group by whatever sort of forces are around, that that's your, that's your combustibility uh, for, uh, for religiously inspired violence, I think, rather than... So I would link it closer to uh, people defending their families, you know, or, or people defending, uh, you know, small groups of, of intimate friends that become under threat, that whenever you have this idea that that religion is a fundamental aspect of your identity, it's like a family. Uh, and, and we don't find it irrational or strange when people become willing to fight and die to defend their families. Uh, and I think that the, the psychological dynamics underlying a lot of religious and, uh, and other types of, of violence, if you want to use the, the phrase there, um, that that's where you're going to find a lot of the power. In the debate in the public sphere with respect to this stuff, people cite, you know, well, the, the suicide bombers of 9-11 or some of these other, you know, high-profile suicide bombers were educated, they were often wealthy, they had families. Um, so what else could be driving? I mean, it doesn't sound like they're experiencing existential threat on an individual level. So is what you're saying that the existential threat is experienced there, but it's experienced at a group level that you don't necessarily see in the individual circumstances? Is, is that the mechanism there? Or yes. Uh, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify. I think there are other factors in, involved here. So I don't want to say that the story I'm telling could explain all of that. I also think uh, you know, there's a reason why it's mostly young men uh, that, are, that are doing this uh, and talking about glory seeking and becoming a hero and a martyr, that there's there's power in that desire for significance and, and being a hero uh, that I think has a real role to play in this. Uh, but that also is in response to some sense of threat, that because there's a threat, you can become heroic. Uh, so that sense of threat doesn't necessarily come from them individually being deprived, although something even as, as intimate and small as having your grandparents uh, stopped at checkpoints constantly uh, are, are humiliated in front of a wide variety of people, that that can stick with somebody in their memory and their sense of self uh, enough, I think, to, to really have a, an impact on these things.